If you have your Bibles, go with me to Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy. We're going to look at the first five verses only today. So it's a uh, most of today will be sort of introductory and overviewing the book, but uh, we will say something about the first five verses, Deuteronomy chapter one, verses one through five. But while you're uh, doing that, by the way, let me uh, make a uh, brief note here. Uh, what well, a brief announcement I should say uh, in that uh, a ministry opportunity has opened up for us, uh, Deuteronomy chapter one, a, a ministry opportunity has opened up for us uh, thanks to the so the Lord using our district missionary, the Lord using um, uh, Trisha, uh, an opportunity has opened up for us to go to, into a nursing home uh, not too far away from here, and uh, we already have a date set Thursday mornings, uh, so we won't be able to go this week uh, because of a prior uh, commitment. But so really, starting on the 29th, we will be able to go into the nursing homes. I believe around 10 a.m. to minister unto the people of God there. And once I have the address, I will give it. But we we thank the Lord. Uh, for it, it's another opportunity for ministries, you know, and it's fitting with the name of this ministry for His glory and holiness ministries, uh, plural. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. The text reads that these are the words which Moses spoke to all Israel across the Jordan and the wilderness. And the Arabah opposite Suth between Paran and Tophiel and Laban and Hezeroth and Dezahab. It is eleven days' journey from Horeb by way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And a fortieth year, on the first day of the eleventh month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. After he had defeated Sion, king of the Amorites, who lived in Heshbon, and Ah, king of Bashan, who lived in Ashtaroth, and Erdai, across the Jordan and the land of Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law, saying, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, may be blessed by the hearing and the reading of God's word on today. Our topic is this, as, as I said, it's, it's mainly introductory in nature, but our topic is this, uh, God's law explained and applied an introduction to Deuteronomy. God's law explained and applied an introduction to Deuteronomy. Let us pray. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for your word. We thank you, God, for it is our spiritual food. It alone is the, the words of life by which men O oh God, may know you, O oh God, for this is eternal life, to know the one true God and the one whom you have sent. Father, again, as we dive into your word, O oh God, and as we engage in another study of one of your uh, life-giving books, O oh God, open our minds, O oh God, to, to understand the scriptures, O oh God, even as, O oh God, uh, the Son did with the two apostles on the road to Aramaeus, O oh God. Uh, oh, yeah, God, let us indeed behold wonderful things from your law, O oh God, and, Oh God, let our hearts be changed by it, oh God. Uh, oh God, let the name of Jesus be lifted up high, oh God, in our eyes, exalted, oh God, above us, oh God. Uh, oh God, as we, oh God, see, oh God, even, oh God, in Deuteronomy, oh God, uh, how your gospel, oh God, is present. Father, oh God, yea, oh God, let your word go out with, oh God, on the arms of the Holy Ghost, oh God, let it fall on good soil, oh God, let it go forth freely and let there be great receptivity, oh God. Uh, I know these lips of clay, O oh God, I ask for thy strength, O oh God, to speak these words, O oh God, uh, to this thy people, O oh God. Uh, Father, we thank you for who you are, for what you have done. We ask these mighty blessings. In the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God's law explained and applied an introduction to uh, Deuteronomy. Uh, so the main idea really of the entire book uh, that I, I want to sort of set out as, as we look at uh, Deuteronomy. I uh, won't probably won't be before you long on this 
beautiful Father's Day morning or afternoon, wherever you may be, uh, it is that in this fact, in view of the grace of God, Moses calls Israel to loving obedience to Yahweh. He does this by expounding on the law given at Sinai so that Israel may know the what and how of faithfulness to the Lord. Israel exists by the grace of God and will be restored due to the same. Their lives should reflect this reality. This is how believers are to respond to the grace of God in Christ on our behalf. Again, in view of the grace of God, Moses calls Israel to loving obedience to Yahweh. He does this by expounding on the law given at Sinai so that Israel may know the what and how of faithfulness to the Lord. Israel exists by the grace of God and will be restored due to the same. Their lives should reflect this reality. And this is how believers are to respond to the grace of God in Christ on our behalf. So first of all, when I say that the uh, Israel exists by the grace of God and be, will be restored due to the same, I mean that even in Deuteronomy, as we get to the end of the book, you know, the Lord is, through Moses, is basically going to tell the people, look, you all are going to abandon me. You all are going to set aside my law. You are all going to go after uh, uh, the, the false gods. And, and I'm going to have to judge you. I'm going to have to send you out the land. I'm going to have to punish you. Uh, but when you turn, oh God, and, and, and repent, I will uh, bring you back. Uh, after I exile you from the land, I, I, I'm going to bring you back. Uh, not because of who you are, but because of who I am, because of grace. And so, you know, from the beginning and the end, uh, uh, the grace of God is surrounded uh, the people of God. Uh, you know, it, uh, it's the, Israel is a people by God's grace. They will remain a people by God's grace. They will be, be gathered by God's grace. And so, uh, you know, if I bring it into today, the beginning and the end of the Christian life is by God's grace. Uh, uh, and, and by God's grace, we travel even now. And, and, and so, uh, when we talk about the faithfulness of God, or we talk about being faithful, being faithful to God, I should say, or or having a faithful life, or living a life of faithfulness, it, 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 that is wrapped in the grace of God. In other words, it, it's not something that ought to be done out of uh, obligation per se, uh, but because we have been transformed, because we understand what he has done uh, for us. And that th this is only the only fitting response that we can give. That is to give our entire lives to him. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, Moses. As I've done with, in book introductions in the past, I, 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 I made a, a printout because I'm going to throw a lot to, out there today. But this is it's under, it's important in understanding and walking through the book of uh, Deuteronomy. And so uh, when we look at the who, I, I sort of struggle with this who, what, when, where, why, and, and, and how. Uh, uh, who is the Deuteronomy is the fifth and final uh, book of Moses. Um, uh, as, as it's listed there in, in the printout, and as it says, this was the consensus view of both Jewish, uh, of, of both Jews and Christians for centuries, up for the first 1800 years of uh, uh, the Christian uh, faith, or the, the first 1800 years after Christ rose, this was the, the understanding. It only began to be challenged around 200 years ago. Uh, you know, the uh, the text that we read in verses 1 and verse 5 uh, made clear that these are the words that came from Moses. Uh, in the text, Moses refers to himself at se several points. Uh, for example, in Deuteronomy 1.16 uh, and uh, Deuteronomy 3.21, Deuteronomy 1.16 and Deuteronomy 3.21, Deuteronomy 31 and 9 clearly says uh, that Moses wrote this law. Uh, and Deuteronomy 20 excuse me, Deuteronomy 31, 24, and 26, or Deuteronomy 31, 24 through 36, uh, 26, it says, uh, it came about when Moses finished writing the words of this law in a book until they were complete, that Moses commanded the Levites to carry the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord, saying, take this book of the law and place it beside the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God, that it may remain there as a witness against you. 
Uh, later writers, later biblical writers affirm this view. Uh, for example, in 2 Kings 14 and 6, but the sons of the slayers he did not put to death according to what is written in the book of the law of Moses, as the Lord commanded, saying, the father shall not be put to death for the sons, nor the sons shall be put to death for the fathers, but each shall be put to death for his own sin. Our Lord and Savior, moving into the New Testament, uh, refers to Deuteronomy 24.1 as coming from Moses. Uh, uh, that's uh, when he was dealing with the issue of divorce. And, you know, when he was uh, expounding on the scriptures to the two disciples uh, uh, on the road to Aramaeus in uh, Luke 24 through uh, uh, Luke 24, 27, it talks about that beginning with Moses, you know, he began to open their minds to the scriptures. Uh, that, that, that's what it talks about in uh, that text. And, and so we, we have this witness both of the writer of uh, the book uh, and of uh, the writers that come later and of our Lord himself uh, that Moses is the one who wrote uh, this book. The, the next sentence I'm going to skip over because it really applies to what I'm going to deal with later. Uh, uh, so that is the who. The, the next question is the what. You know, the Deuteronomy is an interesting name. You know, where, where does that name sort of come from? Well, it, it comes from actually a, an ancient translation of the Old Testament called the, the Septuagint. And uh, in Deuteronomy 17, 8, it, it says in, you know, our Bible now shall come to pass that he sits on the throne of his kingdom. This is talking about when Israel will have a king, he shall write for himself a copy of this law on a scroll in the presence of the Levitical priests. And, uh, you know, in the phrase, a copy of this law was rendered in this ancient translation as uh, there's this repetition of the law. It was treated, in, in other words, uh, as a, a quote unquote second law. And, uh, but now we, we understand that Deuteronomy is not a second law. It is not something that the Lord gave uh, that is separate and distinct uh, uh, from the uh, law that he gave at Sinai. Rather, it is uh, both uh, a restated and it contains uh, both restated and re reformulated material from Exodus through Numbers and new material not found in any of these books. And so... Uh, that's what Deuteronomy is. Uh, it, it is taking what has already been given it and put it, putting it back in front of the people and explaining it and expounding upon it uh, uh, for them. Uh, uh, the Hebrew title of the book is, interestingly enough, saying these are the words, or more simply words. That's sort of the convention, uh, or the Jewish convention, that the, the first sort of sentence or the first couple of words in a book become the name of the book. <coughs> When was Deuteronomy written? Well, Deuteronomy 1 and 3 says, In the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel according to all that the Lord had commanded him. The setting then is 40 years after they came out of Egypt. Uh, if we take an early date from the Exodus, uh, which would be the, uh, around somewhere around the 1440s, then uh, Moses would have wrote this book uh, around the 1400s, as you can see there in the in your notes. Now, uh, since uh, you will have the uh, printout, and again for those of you online who don't, uh, I, I, I'll put it up there. But let me say this: those who reject uh, this uh, that Moses wrote it, they they go so far as to say that it was written in the time of Josiah, the you know the king who sought to bring religious reform to Israel. Where I was. Going to say, I'll put this all online and I'm not going to go through all of the points, but uh, they, they gave the book to around the 7th century BC or the 600s, and so they're basically saying that this book was not written by Moses, even though it claims to be. It was written some 800 years later. Of course, there are several problems with this, and I want to point out a few here. Most importantly is that if Deuteronomy were written during the time that they say it's it's uh, for religious reform. It's deficient because it doesn't mention anything about Judea, uh, Judean kings or your Jerusalem temple. Uh, in fact, it's one reference to a king isn't a ringing endorsement of any kind. 
And, and plus, we have the fact that Yahweh specifically says, uh, the Lord specifically talks about the, uh, the place where I would cause my name to dwell or, or choose to have my name uh, dwell. That doesn't make sense. Uh, uh, the, these absences are inexcusable. That language can't be explained if Deuteronomy was not written uh, by Moses, if it was written at a later time. Uh, Deuteronomy constantly refers to uh, or speaks of a united Israel. Moses says all Israel here. Yeah, that's usually a reference to all Israel. You know, there, there's no reference to a northern, a northern or a southern kingdom. Uh, Deuteronomy warns against the dangers of Canaanite religion and speaks of God you have not known. This only makes sense if the book was written before Israel was in the land uh, with its uh, peoples. Uh, there's more that could be offered, but the point is, you know, we, we have every reason to believe. It's not a fundamental belief. It's a, a rational, reasonable belief that this book was written by Moses. Yes, we, we understand that there have been some changes. Moses probably didn't write the account of his own death. Somebody put that in after the fact. And, you know, we understand that there may have been changes to the text in terms of place names and whatnot, but what we have substantively, we can say came from Moses. Where was, where was this written? Well, uh, the text tells us that they're not yet in the land of Canaan, and it talks about what Israel must do and must not do when they enter the land. And, and so it's fair to say that they're still east of the Jordan River. They have not crossed over yet to why? Why and how? These are the most important uh, sections of the book, and they'll lead us right into the actual verses that we're going to expound upon. Why? Deuteronomy can be thought as a series of sermons, three to be exact. Uh, so chapters one through four, roughly. Uh, the, the, the end of chapter four, going all the way to... Uh, chapter 26 and then uh, roughly 27 through uh, really uh, 27 really all the way to, to 33 uh, given by Moses but these are a series of sermons these are, these are long sermons Ooh. given by Moses right before his death and the ascending of Judah and Joshua as the new leader Moses' goal was to call Israel to be faithful to the covenant of Yahweh. Now, think about it from the mindset of Moses. Moses is about to step off the scene. He's not going to be able to lead them any longer. The Lord has told him because of his own sin, he can look at the land, but he cannot enter in uh, to it. But you know, he's led these people for 40 years. He has a heart for these people. You know, he, he wants to make sure that they understand who their God is, that they understand who they are, that they understand what they're supposed to to do uh, so that they can enjoy, so that they can live and prosper in the land that the Lord is giving to them. You know, he, he wants to make sure that they are, are ready, you know, and, you know, because, you know, he wants them to understand that their loving obedience to him, that is their loving obedience to the Lord, their loving obedience to Yahweh is the proper response of his gracious love on their behalf. This is an important point that must be not be missed, and it's relevant to ours today. Israel wasn't earning anything by being faithful to the covenant. Uh, they weren't the people of God by their own righteousness. It was all God's gracious acts uh, to them, you know. And, and they weren't supposed to presume upon God's favor for them. You know? They weren't supposed to think, you know, as we, we see this in Jeremiah 7, when they talk about the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. God is not going to let anything happen into Jerusalem and Judah. Why? Because the temple of the Lord is there. They, they can live like they want because the temple of the Lord is there. No, 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 no. Moses here in Deuteronomy is restoring all of that. You say, listen, in, 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 the, left, in the first couple of chapters, which is, uh, I haven't yet decided actually how I'm going to deal with, but the first couple of chapters is actually history. History, a lot of it that we've gone over in numbers, actually, uh, that talks about God's grace. He's, he's reminding them, he's taking them back and showing them about God's grace, even in the midst of their unfaithfulness and their rebellion, what the Lord has done. And he's, he's saying, listen, this, upon this basis, uh, you need 
uh, to live for him. What they needed were humble hearts of gratitude that loved the Lord because he loved them. I mean, this is what the, the scripture says in 1 John. We love, or we love him in the King James and New King James because he first loved us. <clears throat> and sure, Moses wrote, quote, not really to give information, but to teach and to persuade. Indeed, this is what a faithful preacher of the gospel does. Not just gives information, but to teach and to persuade, to call the people to holiness, to faithfulness, uh, to righteousness. Not out of some disrupt sense of obligation or begrudging obligation, but because of the love and grace of God that was manifest in our lives. <clears throat> How? How should the people of God deal with Deuteronomy? Well, I submit to you that we should see the gospel in it and how it can still be relevant in our lives. One Old Testament scholar, he wrote uh, these words, and rather than trying to paraphrase it, I just said, I'm gonna use them because they, they, they fit well. He says that few books in the, Old Test in the Older New Testament proclaim such a relevant word of grace and gospel to the church today. He goes on to say, for many Christians, the Old Testament in general, and Deuteronomy in particular, is a dead book. Consequently, the favorite book of Jesus is ignored. The source of much Johannine and Pauline theology is discarded. And the life-giving power of the Word of God is cut off. Unless we rediscover this book, we will not treasure the Old Testament as a whole. This book presents the gospel according to Moses. This is a gospel of divine grace lavished on undeserving human beings. Moses' vision for his own people serves as a microcosm for the divine vision of humanity as a whole. The book points the reader to the Lord God who has redeemed his people and assigned them the mission of radiating his grace to the world, end quote. Indeed, and all the way back in Exodus, the Lord talked about Israel being a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. As we're going to see in Deuteronomy, their faithfulness to the law was supposed to prompt all the other nations to look and, and wonder at their laws and by extension wondering at their God and give praise to his name. Uh, and indeed, that's what the, the Lord told Moses to say to Pharaoh back in Exodus 19. For this reason I have raised you up to, uh, to proclaim my name in the earth, to show forth my mighty power. And this is indeed the goal, the mission of the church today, to proclaim God in Christ, uh, to preach Jesus Christ in him, crucified, the one who is in the image of the invisible God, who is the exact representation of his nature. Uh, the one who, you know, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery, you know, to be equal with God, uh, you know, as the good old King James uh, says, Jumping into the text, jumping into the text, we Moses tells us, Moses tells Moses expounds on the law. So he says, uh, again, it tells us in the first four verses, you know, you know, these words were spoken by Moses to all Israel, but they find their origin in Yahweh. And that's in verse three. Moses spoke to the children of Israel uh, according to all that the Lord had commanded him to give to them. A couple of things I need to point out, even in these first couple of verses, the words came at the at the end of their wanderings. The people of God were on the cusp of possessing the land after 40 years in the wilderness. They had significant victories on the east side of the Jordan, which they resided. Uh, as we saw in Numbers, the Lord delivered several kings into their hands. Still, uh, they were not finished. They were not in the land. And still, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. Notice how verse 2 says, after telling us all of this, it says, it was 11 days journey from Horeb by the way, by the way of Mount Seir to Kadesh Barnea. And a 40th year on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the children of Israel. So, he's pointing out that the actual journey should have only taken 11 days. Yet, He's speaking this on the 11th month, uh, on the, in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month. Okay, so 
uh, uh, this is what we want to see as we're reading and studying the scriptures. How do we go from 11 days to uh, him speaking in the 40th year on the first day of the 11th month? If it's an 11 days journey, why is it that they were in the wilderness for so long? Uh, and of course we know this because we have walked through numbers. And But here again, Moses, right at the beginning of his exposition of the law of God, his explaining the law that has been given, uh, he's pointing out the seriousness of sin. He's, he's telling them right up front. This journey should have only been 11 days, uh, but it took so much longer. And as he's going to unpack in the next verses that you know we'll, we'll, we'll see next week, it took so much longer because of disobedience. It took so much longer uh, because of rebellion. It's no small thing uh, to disobey a holy God. It, it's particularly egregious for the people of God who know the truth. Uh, it is a serious matter when you know what to do. When you know the right thing to do and you do not do it. In this specific case here, Israel had experienced the power of God on their behalf and his love and care for them. Yet he, they did not trust him. Sorry, there's a typo here. They did not trust him and they paid the price by never entering the land. The point here that we can see right at the beginning is clear. The price of sin is high. It is so high that none can really afford to pay it. In fact, none can afford to pay it at all. You know, whatever temporary benefits that we think that we're getting from not following God, we will pay for it in the end. The generation that came out of Egypt did not enter in. Their children and their grandchildren did. They lost out though, on receiving that was, was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because they refused to take heed to the word of, of God. Moses is putting that right there at the beginning. Understand what happened here. Understand what is at stake. Understand why your alternative to faithfulness is no real alternative uh, at all. Understand, Moses is going to talk about later in the books, but I said before you, life and death, choose life. Moses, right at the beginning, is setting forth the need to choose life. Let us take heed to this. Sin cannot be taken lightly. The sinless Son of God had to come and die on a cross for it so that we could be reconciled to a holy God. We dare not take it lightly. Verse 5 says that, uh, that across the Jordan of the Lamb, Moab, Moses undertook to expound this law. What do we mean by that? I said about that Deuteronomy was written to call all Israel to faithfulness to Yahweh. What does it mean to be faithful? I'm sure many of us could come up with various answers to that question, but I submit to you that the faithful that faithfulness to the Lord simply entails living according to his revealed will. It means doing what he said to do and not doing what he says not to do. Uh, again, of course, motivated by a heart that's been transformed by the grace of God. Uh, for the Israelites, this was the law given at Sinai. After Moses died and Joshua is the new leader, the Lord told him, again, another time of these words of Joshua 1 8, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have success. See, true prosperity, true success is tied not to, not to who you know uh, uh, or what degrees that you have gotten or, or this, that. It's true success in the kingdom of God. True su success from God's perspective is tied to adherence to his word. Tied to uh, adherence to uh, his uh, word. <clears throat> this is the goal of Moses. What we have in Deuteronomy is an exposition of the law. Yes, it restates a lot of the earlier material, but it goes beyond this. 
Uh, it adds new material, but what's really going on here is that Moses is uh, the, uh, taking the law and he's explaining it and he's applying it to their particular situation, you know, to them right about to enter the promised land. Uh, you know, it had to be expounded and emphasized. It, he had to make it sort of relevant for them, you know, in order for them to be successful uh, going forward. They needed to have an unbroken covenant relationship with the Lord. Uh, bringing this in, I told you I wouldn't be before you longer. We have not moved beyond our need to hear the law, the law of God. Or for that matter, the gospel of Christ Jesus. We still need to hear the word of God. You see, it's only by knowing the holy requirements of a holy God that we can see and understand our need for the gospel of Jesus Christ. It is by keeping the truth of the gospel ever before us that we can appreciate the grace of God and govern ourselves accordingly. Moses sought to take God's law and make it relevant for the people in their circumstance. And again, every faithful preacher of God's word today is called to do the same. Uh, now, while the Lord does it and never did save, it does reveal, reveal to us the nature of our God. And as it says, you have there 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, says that all scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. We can benefit from studying Deuteronomy as we have from the prior four books, and we will with the rest of the New Testament. That's why I wanted to read a Psalm 19, because the, the Psalm writer uh, understood that the you know the law of God is nothing uh, that is oppressive, that is not burdensome. He said the law of the Lord is perfect, restore of the soul, Psalm 19, 7. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise to simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. They are more desirable than gold, yea, than much fine gold, sweet also than honey and the drippers of the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is more, and in keeping them there is great reward. We need the word of God. We, we need it applied to our lives. We need it kept ever before us. So that is how we can be fed. That is how we can grow. That is how we can remain faithful. That was Moses' goal with Deuteronomy, and it is our goal today. So I hope that you all are as excited as I am to dive deep into this book. It is delicious food for our souls. Amen. Amen. Now, I want to return to real quickly what I had said a few moments ago, and that the, you know, the law did not, could not, it was not designed to save. I said before that, that the, the law was not given so that Israel could be made righteous in the sense that their righteousness did not come or could not come by keeping uh, the law. They were not the people of God because they kept the law. They were the people of God because of his gracious salvation of them. What was true for Israel is still true today, and that is we cannot be made righteous before God uh, just by doing the works of the law or by trying to keep the law on our own strength. We cannot be made righteous before God by our good works because you see, the whole need for the sacrificial system, which was outlined in great detail in the book of Leviticus, was because the Lord knew that we were going to fail to keep the law of God. 
and if you know your Bible, you know that the, the history of Israel, sadly, is one of failure after failure after failure. Because it is not within the power of man, within his flesh, to please God. And in fact, Scripture tells us that uh, and that's not our inclination, you know. Right after the flood, what did the Lord say? I will never again destroy the earth by the flood because, you know, man, a man's ways are wicked from his youth. Uh, you might say, oh, well, then what, 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 what's the point? What, why, why even go through this? Well, the, the point is because we see that our hope cannot be in the law, but we also see that we are not without hope. Uh, even as Israel had a way made for them to be made right with God in the sacrificial system, so uh, look, the Lord God has made a way, you know, the, the Father, since this is Father's Day, has, has made a way uh, for his wayward creation to become sons and daughters of him. And, and that way is in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're someone who cannot say on today that you cannot honestly call God a father, uh, you cannot say that you have sought to live a life of faithfulness. Uh, you know, you, you're saying, yeah, I, I've heard the gospel, I've heard the word of God before, but I've never given heed or credence to it now. And, you know, as you've been listening, you, you see, I, you fall outside of that faithfulness camp, uh, that righteousness of God camp. Uh, uh, and, and that grieves you up. I, I, I'm glad that it does uh, because that's the spirit of God working in your heart. But I, I don't want you to just stay there in your grief. I want you to move to the next step, which is to repent and believe the gospel. That is to acknowledge and confess your sin before God. That the fact that you are guilty for breaking his law, that you have not kept it perfectly as it should be kept. In fact, none of us have, for the record. And that you know, therefore, that you are guilty before God. But then not even to stop there, but to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That he was born of a virgin. That he lived that perfect life. He perfectly kept the law. He did what we could not do. So that he could credit what he did to us. So that we could be righteous. He perfectly kept the law so that when he died on the cross, it was for not his sins, his crimes, his wrongdoing, his wickedness. He had none of this, but for the sins of men and women and boys and girls. When he died, when, he, when they crucified him, he died and they buried him, but he did not stay dead. He rose again on the third day. We have life because he is the resurrection and the like. He rose from the dead on the third day, uh, satisfying the righteous requirements of a holy God, uh, making it so that we could not just call him God, but we could call him Father. Uh, and he ascended at the right hand of the majesty on high. Confess this Jesus as Savior and Lord, trusting on his works and not anything about you, and you will be saved. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today is the day to ask for forgiveness and to be received into his kingdom. Don't delay, but repent and believe the gospel on today. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your word. The whole word, oh God, all of it, oh God, is possible for teaching, for proof, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Father, we thank you, O oh God, for the service that you've raised up to expound, to explain, uh, to enlighten, and to give uh, your people understanding of your word so that we may live according to it. Father, as we uh, expound upon your word in our study of the Deuteronomy, O oh God, and as we Oh God, read and study your word in our day-to-day -day lives. Father, I even pray, oh God, that it be written upon the tablets of our hearts, oh God, that it would penetrate the intellect, oh God, and that it would go in the intellect, oh God, but it would penetrate the intellect, going down beyond bone and marrow into soul and spirit. Yea, oh God, that 
Yeah, you're gonna give us a heart, a, a love for your word, oh God, so that we never see it as uh, an oppressive obligation, oh God, but as loving obedience to a loving and gracious God. Yeah, you're God, as we read and study your word, oh God, let your word do the work in all of the hearts of all of its hearers for your glory and for your honor. Father, I thank you, oh God, for this day, oh God, I thank you, oh God, uh, for fathers, oh God, for fathers who love their sons and their grandsons and their godsons, oh God, and, and their adopted sons, oh God, and those whom they have stepped into the role of father, oh God. Oh, we thank you, God, for those of whom may not have a father, oh God, but now know you, oh God, as father. Father, I pray, oh God, that you would, oh God, touch every father under the sound of my voice, oh God, specifically, oh God, that you would draw them nigh unto you, oh God, that they would look to their father, uh, even as they seek to be a uh, good uh, father, oh God. And, oh God, I pray very under the sound of my voice, God, that you keep us from hurt, harm, and danger, oh God, throughout this week, that you go with us and before us, oh God, that keep on us round about on every side. Uh, father, I pray for safe travel and mercies over the highways and byways, all those have to travel, oh God, that uh, you would bring us to our homes, oh God, or other destinations quickly and safely, oh God, and bring us back at the next appointed time. Father, we thank you. We ask these mighty blessings in the matchless and mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up the light of his countenance upon you. May he give you peace. Amen.